channel. Uh, I'm just clicking uh, record now. So we're talking pr principally, thank you all for joining us, uh, about this wonderful book by Tamsin. And, um, and I know uh, Clover is a big fan of that book. I might also add, I've also got Clover's book here, which I'm sure uh, Tamsin wouldn't mind me just giving a little plug as well. So, um, um, so the, the form tonight is um, Clover's going to be chatting to Tamsin, half an hour, 40 minutes maybe. I'm going to be badgering you all to put some questions through on the Q&A function. You can see along the bottom you see Q&A. Uh, if you could fill in uh, a few lovely questions and uh, I will return at sort of 30 or 40 minutes and, uh, and, uh, and, and ask all your questions. Um, so without further ado, can I hand over to, to the wonderful Clover Stroud? Thank you very much. And it's lovely to be here. Let's obviously see Tamsin as well. Um, so, I mean, I think your book hardly needs an introduction. It, it was described by Vogue as a memoir of the year and um, the Sunday Times as beautifully written and emotionally intense. And we know that it is about your move in 2004 to a remote Scottish island. And you, you talk about um, your motivation for moving there as a kind of disenchantment and really falling out of love with urban life. Um, knowing what you know now and the challenges that you faced when you moved there, looking and you look back on, on the move, do you see that kind of um, first arrival on this beautiful but incredibly remote sort of overly optimistic and um, naive about what you were facing or were you moving there with a sense of desperation running away from urban life what was your sort of mood as you got there I think there was a bit of everything in that way in that that experience was so completely unknown we both knew Scotland we both um, had very, very strong links to that. Myself from childhood, my ex, because um, he actually had Scottish heritage. So it, it kind of made sense to do that heading north. I guess the difference was that um, we were really going with a one-way ticket and that makes a huge difference. You know, it wasn't just go and dip your toe in. Um, we had found the croft where well, we, we went up there really with a, with a view to a recce and to look around. And that had been part of a bigger exploration looking overseas as well as in the UK. And both of us said, um, you know, we were very attuned to sensitivities of, of small community living. You know, I myself had lived in various different communities throughout the world um, in Southeast Asia as well, you know, really, really remote up in the high foothills of um, Vietnam and, um, uh, yeah, all, all sorts of places. So um, it kind of, it didn't feel as extreme as that. And yet it felt so much more extreme because having seen this incredible craft on our visit north, um, we were very fortunate in that it all happened very, very fast. And so literally from seeing it to actually being there was six weeks. Wow. So we came we came back down south we'd been up there for about two months and um we came back south and and that was us we were sort of packing up and um getting stuff ready for that move and i think that was the intensity of it um that really you know anything that was being loaded in the van it was real sort of well are we going to bring this are we going to need this or are we going to give it away we're going to chuck it out um, we did travel quite light, but we, we still had a lorry which didn't get on that boat. And so, you know, ironically, it was actually myself making that crossing um, with a cat in the back of the car. And that was about it, really. So um, that first night was, yeah, it felt very, very real. I think there was all of that, Clover. You know, I think think back to when um, thinking maybe some big decisions that you might have been making um, in your very early 30s, you know, um, our hearts are full of hope yeah. and dreaming yeah. and luckily I mean luckily that we're not you know we're not jaded and yeah you know you could say we get more cynical we get life gets harder you don't make such fast decisions possibly um mm. do you do you look back because obviously you faced huge challenges 
over the next um, decade and a half, which we'll, yeah. we'll talk about in a minute. But do you look back and feel, sometimes I look at back at myself as a younger woman in earlier life, knowing what was to come next and feel a sense of sort of slightly protective, you know, knowing that you're going to have to walk through real real furnaces basically do you feel kind of protective do you do, do you feel like you were slightly naive or because you obviously the croft had um which you knew about had no water no electricity you were taking yeah. up a, it wasn't just throwing up a kitchen extension was it it was a huge amazing yeah it was project. it was a huge project but we kind of i guess because we decided this was for the long term and it really was with the idea of having family and i already knew that that wasn't likely to happen with ease um I'd already kind of started that process so there was yeah there was all of that um we had already done a renovation in London so I guess we were sort of part attuned but yeah on an island it's a totally different ball game you know I mean everything's got to be everything's got to be organized mm. I mean even getting your fuel over from the mainland you know we used to take a little boat and load up with jerry cans so I mean imagine getting stocks and supplies and provisions that was a really steep learning curve and you know that's something that doesn't need to be learned when you're local um because that that's just 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 the way of life isn't it so there's all those kind of little infrastructures and microcosms that that everything needed negotiating um and that first summer was idyllic it, it was a heat wave you know I mean you couldn't you couldn't have asked for a better time to arrive so we had you know eight eight to twelve weeks of just scorching hot sun and we really uh I guess broke the back of the outside work in those months and it didn't feel like work because it was it was you know it was the doing it was the dream and you know you just sling on your on your overalls and nothing on underneath and you'd, there was no washing facilities so you just go and hurl yourself into the fresh water at the bottom of the loch and yeah that that was amazing I mean there was there was a lot of work to be done you know the whole roof to go back on um walls that needed um really a lot of attention there'd be a, been a fire here um which was um you know a, a sadder story and um yeah, amongst all the beauty, and I think I write of that in the third chapter, there is this undercurrent that clearly, you know, when you're living out at the margins, life isn't always easy. And seasonal changes show that that different face um, with greater intensity the further into the year that you go. And there's there's a real truth and a beauty with that, isn't there? I guess maybe that was nature sort of helping us to flex and really manage expectations as well you know we, we really had quite um you know we had a big job to do for that first winter and we did get in mm. and um you know my childhood was very very simple it was um you know it was it, it everything was homemade um and so for that it felt like being at home did it feel um, like coming so home? I've I've never been a sort of I mean you can see from my kitchen you know this is 20 years later I haven't got a dishwasher um you know there isn't enough water pressure to have that so um you know things things are really really simple and 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 I find that actually very freeing and very enabling certainly with you know creative work but no I mean back in those times I think the hardest adjustment was probably adjusting to the cold of the cottage at that point mm -hmm. and this part of the house is totally un uninsulated so at that time there was um just a little hole in in the end wall mm -hmm. and you know you try and get um you try and get heat off that you know had to put a stove in and um yeah just just you wear layers yeah. um but I think it's an acclimatization, isn't it? It's a bit like, you know, those people out there that are cold water swimmers. It seems um, really intense at the beginning, but actually you, yeah. you, you, you achieve. Um, the, the book is about, um, I mean, it's about many different things. It's, it's about your relationship with the island and it's about your relationship with the natural world. It's about um, your relationship uh, with your partner. Uh, with the with the islanders it's about redemption it's about it's also and it's in, incredibly incredibly beautifully written and, it's, and it is also optimistic but it is 
um, I mean, you you don't hold back at all, which I think is is great. I I want to read something which is honest about the challenges and the problems that you faced, um, from you know the, the problems with the farming and problems with your relationship and problems with the uh, relationship with with the other villagers and mm. um, and going through IVF as well. At some, you know, and at some point, there's there's one point where you are, you break both of your hands, and your best friend is killed in a terribly tragic car crash. Mm. Um, you're forced to eat leaves at one point because you're so mm. hungry. How did you? Is it is an almost you know, kind of beyond human story of survival? Tell us more about what enabled you to not just survive, but really, really thrive in this very very harsh environment which was filled with huge huge challenges and and tragedies along the way yeah i mean now looking back in the catalog that it's um i sometimes sort of yeah there's a breath and actually it's a heart ache mm. as well for all of that mm. and um it yeah and just thinking of the lack of comfort really um you know there wasn't there wasn't much give in those years mm. and I don't know if that's a good thing or not because sometimes you know if all of the help is there it couldn't have been all the help really for those things you know the the relationship had to be the the sort of trials of that you know, there needed to be a privacy um in, in some shape or form. And I felt very, very strongly, very strongly about that because, you know, there was always this wonder, there was always a hope, would it, would it come right? Mm -hmm. And it's like anything. So I think there are certain things you do hold within your walls. I, I, I'd sort of, my closest friendship was with Crystal and um, she was there with me throughout. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I don't know what I would have done when the relationship broke down and having only just lost you know the babies and um that was really the shattering of that whole sort of trajectory um that you know I'd, I'd been pursuing that for nearly nearly 15 years so it, you know that that sort of failure as well within one's own body is is utterly devastating and I think that's not really spoken about much it's one of the great silence griefs within society you know a third of a third of women don't have children it doesn't always end with um, a child in your arms and you know it wasn't just the fertility we'd looked at adoption and um, in, in various different ways I'd actually tried three times and there'd just been legislative problems there was one which was overseas and then you know faults within the system up here just just things were just showing themselves you could say that it it wasn't going to happen and maybe that's a good thing in some ways you know um, and you're so set and focused on that that I think that was almost the hardest part the more subtle things that were falling apart rather than you know when your hands break um, first one and then the other and that was a huge thing to deal with but at least it's sudden right you know yeah whereas the other it's this um implosion and the silent breaks I, I remember we actually stripped some of that out in the edit and maybe because it would have been just too um too painful to read but it was really exploring that process of um shattering and what that feels like do you think that's such an interesting idea do you think that you do you think that your experiences and in a way your relationship with the island which is incredibly strong and beautiful and bountiful and creative but do you think the island sort of which i haven't thought of this before but kind of broke you in order to see you reborn i i wonder that that's a really intuitive perceptive um thought clover and i rather love that for um you know one of the other threads that i know you and i both share and love which is you know the whole grail 
stories and the yeah. Fisher King and the renewal of the land. And, and I touch on that, you know, that that was actually a, a much more, again, written in thread. And um, we stripped some of that back as well. But all this thing of, you know, right at the beginning, I talk about how you've got to bleed your joys and your sorrows into the land, as has been ad infinitum um, over millennia here. You know, the stones on my walls what stories have they heard both outside on the croft when they were still in the soil and then prized by hand, you know, when would that have been, um, you know, 17th, 18th century and the hardships, it's a hard way of life. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a love and there is um, a real deep bond both ways. Mm -hmm. And I think a great amount of respect now that um, not just to write the book and to name some of the difficult things that really needed naming and that, you know, challenging to uh, talk about subtle things such as bias and how these all find us. Again, the invisible, the invisible, the intangible yeah. is so much harder than the big things. Yeah. The big things you just kind of cope with. Um, but no, I love, I love that about the, um, you have to break down in order to renew again. Yeah. And from that, um, you know, right at the beginning, I think I say, um, you know, even sometimes a seed has to be forced to grow. Mm. And perhaps we would never find our fullest potential and reach our profound depths were we not to have all of that that asks of us. And, and you know, I wonder what you feel about that, Clover. Well, I think, I mean, certainly, like you, I've also, and I've written about, you know, having a life which has been marked by a certain amount of really, really deep trauma. And mm. people often go, oh, gosh, you know, I'm so sorry. And you've been through such suffering. And and they they want to kind of articulate a kind of sympathy as if they want to take it away and to make it better. And, yes. And I, but I, and I really write about this, in my first book, The Wild Other, about the fact of that kind of traumatic experience being part of, completely part of who I am, but also, and I re I'm realizing this so much more as I get older and I'm finishing my third book now, it's part of who I am creatively as well. And that feels really essential. And that kind of rub of the pain, you know, the, yeah. the your blood is, it, it, it matters. And that's what, that's what, goes now informs so much more of my writing and I can feel that so strongly in your writing you know your soul and your suffering is absolutely there in the words mm. um, and, and it's that's... still it's and it's still there you know we've talked of this before should... how it does change your DNA and I've, I've I've read about this as well and it's not something we can accept all sorts of things but it's still part of us mm. and so it should be you know life is here to make us feel and perhaps asks of us to share some of those bigger experiences with others so that we're we're always on this lovely spiraling loop of giving and receiving and you know this year I have to say has been so incredible for me to be building new communities as well like this you know we, we didn't know each other I remember a year ago and you know and it's been wonderful um and each time we have this depth of conversation and 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 that for me is also transformative and so I suppose when you really connect and have those uh, deep bonds with other people that are feeling these things and you and you're kind of flexing and shaping it I feel like we're, we're almost like potters Yes. and we're molding our own clay mm. and we can take a bit of it out can't we mm. and just apply something to it and let's take it into nature or let's kind of bring it into the home life or let's hand it to somebody else or one of your children and mm. everyone will sort of have a formation in that and then it'll kind of either be put aside or it'll go back in and then it'll kind of reform itself and I'm always fascinated by that with art in whatever shape or form how that experience then when you start to work with it then starts to recreate its own energy it becomes its own animism yes. and takes on a life of its own and so mm. your book to me will mean something mm. totally different to somebody else and and you know can also change at different times of our experience as well so I've gone back to your book uh, The Wild Other and 
each time I find it helpful in a totally different way um, because it's filling gaps for me, um, certain things that I perhaps missed in my childhood. So that's um, like the kind of creative energy of your work as something that exists separate from yourself is in, is very very exciting isn't it as a as a writer that feeling of creating a world which you send into other people's worlds and it can affect and change and yeah and influence other people's thinking is a is a wonderful a wonderful feeling it's also a um you know it's it's very raw and and it can be nerve-wracking and people often say to me oh you're so brave writing so honestly you write incredibly honestly do you feel that it does does demand a certain amount of bravery from you and how do you you know we, we we both write memoir how do you kind of deal with this fact that people know about you and they know your story and they know what you've been through yeah it's an interesting one that so to kind of strip that back if we go back to where we were talking about um the energy um, and what we're giving to other people and the responsibility as well, I suppose, with that and, and to those close to us as well. Mm. Um, but there's also that thing of the environment that's sharing itself with us. And that's the great unknown. And I talk of the landscape and nature as a, as a presence. It's a sentience and a, a deep consciousness. And to tap into that is really where all of my work seems to come from so if I'm if I'm using this and I'm sort of sitting down I'm thinking oh I'm really you know enough sheep let's <laughs> got, to, got to get on with some writing now I've got a you know a longer deadline for this next book that I'm writing and uh, that's a very different process but you know there is the nature there is the experience mm. live it mm. and let it live through and then somehow, and, and I think maybe my other work, because, you know, my my other side of me, I touch on this in the book, but I, I work in natural medicine. So I'm a, I'm a healer and I work with acupuncture and all sorts of um, uh, kind of energy work, um, neuromuscular pain, trauma. I work with the GP surgeries as well. So and I have a private practice. So all of these things, I think, are helpful mm. because it it. I'm really fascinated by that, how the, the process of working with people one to one in a clinic environment or doing a barefoot practice with animals is actually no different or, or backing a horse mm. or working with sheep and working out how to approach even a wild bird or, or so that it will come to us is all the same energy. Mm. And it's a bit like meditation or for some people prayer or for some people just going into a space of becoming one with all that's around or casting a line if you're catching a fish and just, you know, that that suspension. And, and you, but you're with the line. Yeah. And you're you're with that little tug. That for me is all part of that process. And so when it comes, there it is. And you, you then have the responsibility and thank goodness for it you know, our, our shared amazing team at Doubleday Transworld, um, because that's also part of that formation. And to be able to, that's nerve wracking. Mm. And I know you're nearly at that point again, of handing <laughs> that over and you're just sort of feeling like a child again. That That's the really tough bit. Um, you know, and I, I don't have anyone to share my work with unless it's with um, that team, I suppose. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting that actually about about your relationship with your publisher as well. And as a writer, if you're if you're writing to be published, about the trust you have in them, about the way they're going to you're writing. Well, they know they know everything. They know more than the reader, yeah. mm. and your agents will know even more than that. So, um, <laughs> you know, there are sort of degrees of openness, aren't there? Yeah. And um, and I think that's a really helpful journey as well as to, you know, how, how best to shape, because that's another part of the crafting. Um, but that thing, I think, with Ireland, with I'm an Island, um, it always felt the emotional um, truth that was coming through. Well, clearly, these things were personal to me, and yet I was writing of the great big experiences that we all face. and so. 
the language was absolutely instrumental for that. So rather than making it quite so bespoke or specific to me, obviously we've got these events, but by handing, offering a hand to the reader and, and writing in much more of a sensory way. So there's a lot of silence within the book where I'm trying not to actually answer for the reader's own experience or to anticipate how they might experience or feel that or what they might lend into it and I think you know I always loved European films when I was younger and there's a great amount of silence in, in some of in some of that as a medium and to try and get a little bit more of a, a breath and a breathing space within the writing felt as important to sort of writing it as actually you know wondering how the reader might then respond to it yeah, does so, that make a bit, yeah, bit like music in a way a respect and an aware an absolute awareness of the reader and and of their yeah. experience but the, the writing is so powerful and it's so rich and it's it's dense as well so it gives you a really strong feeling of your kind of deepening um kind of atavistic primal bond with the island and with the water and with the animals and with the yeah. leaves and the soil and the sheep and that's as a reader, it's unusual to experience an almost tactile sense of the world that you are inhabiting. Um, yes. You also described it as, as it, the book is about the feminine will to survive. And I was interested to know what you meant by that exactly. Well, I've always been, um, I suppose, um, with this longing for motherhood and with that being unfulfilled in the traditional way, I suppose how then we re-channel and re-navigate that incredibly deep force mm. that's there within us, you know? I mean, that's, we're here, we're here really, you know, at a sort of very uh, basic, level to sort of pass on our genes and when that thwarts you in whatever way and however many different ways that you try it then I was almost being unconsciously shaped I felt by this incredible natural world and the rhythms and the cycles mm -hmm. and really tapping into that and just letting myself be guided I suppose and so you know, these, these tools that are our hands and our instincts, they're very, very deep. They're almost like ley lines within us. So we talk about reading landscape outside. Let's talk about reading landscape inside. And then when the two are tuned, that's when you have something really powerful. And I was having to douse for water um, on, on the croft. And um, it was actually a lot like um, when I'm taking pulse uh, diagnostic pulses um with with patients and in a sense it's a little bit like writing as well when you're sort of trying to find that right word mm. but you're not you're not sort of looking at it you know in that way of oh I'm going to get the dictionary out now no. I don't know about you but it's very reflexive mm. it's a bit like playing the piano with the keyboard mm. and it'll go and it'll go and then you and, and, and suddenly I'm there, there's the word. Where there did that come from? Where did it come from? Yeah. Where does it? Where does? How does that happen? And it's the most beautiful thing when you tap into that. Yeah. So I think all of this. Um, I'm sure that you know I can't speak for a, a man because I I I don't know many male writers personally, and I've not spoken about that process of writing. That would be a very interesting conversation to have. Mm. Um, I suspect it might be a little different to how I um, have been, you know, working with Ireland. And just in that way of real, the sort of, that real sort of sensory flow. And for me, that really felt like, uh, it's, it's, it's like the, that, that pure feminine nurture and giving, I suppose, in a sense that I wanted to give to a child, to my animals, to wildlife, to trees, birds, whatever it is. And in a sense, you're then translating that, you know, this is now a child yeah. that you're loving in all sorts of ways. And love isn't always easy, is it? I mean, uh, you know, as a mother, sometimes we've 
got to have the tough lines as well mm. and we've got to expose ourselves and others to those experiences that make the heart beat faster that mm. make the heart ache that that make us fearful and and to actually understand these things in a way that's safe so to make feelings safe mm. Mm. because particularly when we've both of us have shared trauma mm. actually rediscovering the route through to actually even be aware of those feelings as a huge thing you know the writing was very very instrumental for that yeah yeah um so so complex isn't it it's complex i think it'd be so interesting to have a conversation with a man as well about you know technically and creatively and emotionally how you actually create that experience basically and how you how it happens how many when you were writing how long can you sit down and write for before you need to go and be with the sheep or go swimming or or do something yeah different? well that process with I'm an island was very very intense mm -hmm. um so it started off and I wrote an email to um this wonderful agent and um I'd, I'd read something that she'd um helped work with before and literally she picked up the phone and and um I just said I need help there's a story here it's big um I don't quite know how to get to all of it will you help me and we'd signed within 10 days, I think. And then there was a process of about nine months to get it to um, Frankfurt. And then wonderful publishing team then stepped in. So we signed contract probably about sort of November, early December. And my deadline was for April. Oh, wow. So it was, <laughs> it was quite intense. Um, so I was up at four every morning and I wasn't stopping till about midnight and um, writing all the way through that time I was writing and then I was swimming and I was holding the croft together so I I was living and um yeah doing all the things that I need to do you think the intensity of that experience doing it in such a short period of time because I'm sure the book that I've yeah. just written has been informed by the intensity of being in a, I, you know, being isolated with my family and not having the normal going to a meeting or going and meeting, you know, seeing somebody, socialising, being out in the world. And I was writing. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm sure it's actually helped the writer creatively. I think it's helped the experience that there hasn't you live it. been lots of dilution yeah. in a way. You know, you go out into the yeah. world sort of diluting. If you're trying to write something intensely personal, you're sort of diluting it when you go out into the yeah. world, aren't you? I mean, I I have, I mean, all this social media is quite sort of, all this, you know, it's only an Instagram uh, thing that I have, but I'd never done Zoom. I'd never done Zoom before. Yeah. And um, I have a I have a trusty old radio and I switch that on first thing in the morning. And unless there's something specific, um, this is kind of a 1970s childhood when you had sort of catalogues, but I do like to sort of see where the programs are on the radio. So I'll, I'll list something that I want to listen to, but the rest of the time it's really quiet. And, um, you know, at that time I also have wild birds actually in the house mm. because I was rehabilitating them and they were learning to fly safely. So, you know, it, 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 it was really the, the life of the croft was this. Mm. I don't have a television and that's actually deliberate because um, I, I'm, I, I can find that can sort of trigger things. Um, anything I can't see anything that's frightening even frightening music so um yeah. that that sort of you know a, a weak spot for me so I just I haven't had a television in what 11 years now so um I'm interested by that the sense because I completely know what you're talking about with the um with television and and the kind of the sort of fear and violence it can bring with it as well and yet you are somebody who is um happy to swim on your own in sub-zero temperatures yeah. and to sleep out in extremely yeah. remote places that many people would find terrifying and to push yourself physically spiritually emotionally to really extreme extreme places do you think of yourself as a brave person no i'm a participator um so i'm i so long as i'm involved Mm. that's a lot easier than sitting as a bystander mm. 
Um, and so, so one good example, there was a, there was something on in the hall one time, I think it was Life of Pi, and there's one awful moment where I think the, the chimpanzee gets hurt, and there was a big crash, and people thought I passed out, and um, it wasn't, it was something, a box falling off at the back of the, back of the hall, but on the way home, um, somebody had knocked down a lamb, and um, on the road, because there, there, there aren't often fences, mm. and, you know, that was no problem to actually pick up that lamb and then take that home and, and stitch it up and and care for that I'm I'm absolutely fine when I'm I'm involved right um it's it's the witnessing I cannot be a bystander when there's stuff um going on you know so I think maybe that's the difference and do you think that's, the, that's about the 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 um the human spiritual as well as when you screen you are actually connected to it whereas you're talking about a kind of warm breathing living being that needs you and even if that it, you know the lamb may have been in a bad way but you are able yeah then you have to help um, you have to help um well i mean that's kind of you know that that that's that's my response um and i think also you know, I mean, that process with the swimming, it, it wasn't always that way. So at the beginning, um, you know, any of my friends from years back uh, will say she hates cold water. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> so, um, you know, I mean, I, I grew up, um, I was fearless with with water from when I was very small. You know, um, we, we were down on the south coast and um, we had a beach hut. You know, it was always very, very free for that. But it's a very different deal up here. And um, I think that was a very interesting process, the series of steps that you go through. So lying in bed, it's warm, it's four in the morning, the sun's coming up. Um, let's say that that sort of turn of the year, you know, the, the, the sunrise here gets really, really early. Oh, yeah. And that was so important as a way of, as a real anchor, as a presence, as, as you know, talked about the at atavistic um, instinct, you know, since the beginning of time, as humans, our, our eyes have no doubt yearned in the darkness to see the light. And, you know, all of these amazing stone circles and, um, you know, ways of honoring light, you know, that, that presence of light is so important and fire and all the rest of it. So you've got fire and then you've got the great pull of the water. And if you think about that, that is the great axis of life, mm. the heart and the kidney, the fear and the will which is the kidney and the the heart and the the strength and the bravery yet also fear with that too mm. and I think when the two come into alignment you know one can quench the other or we can actually have this amazing sort of uh, bubbling sort of effervescence and that's when you get the sort of the beauty mm. and so that process of there's the sun lifting over the sea and, and I'm suddenly on my way to the water with Maud and you've got your camera, you've got your flask, you're not even, you know, everything's packed at the door, you go. And it becomes like a, a rhythm and a routine. So if there's any holding back, you're, you're done for. Yeah. You know, you just have to do that. As soon as I got my swim boots on, mm. that was it, I was out the door and actually Maud wasn't gonna let me stop at that point because she's totally into the, into the water too. But when you get down there and then you've got this urgency and not just because there's a finite time where it's just a glow and then suddenly there's this moment when it just starts to lift this great ball of fire over the horizon and then the sea does something extraordinary and you've got to be there to see it and it happens about 10-15 uh, minutes before that actual lift and it's well before the birds start to call and all of that great sort of call to life mm -hmm. um, the sea itself awakes and you've got this incredible flexing of the muscle. And it's like this joyful dance, the sort of universal um, energies mm. of there's the sun or there's the moon coming down, whichever time of day you're, you're swimming. And actually this time of year, they're both in the sky at the same time, which is just extraordinary. You've got an orange and amber moon and then the sun rising. I mean, how, how incredible. And, you know, one's sinking beneath to the roots of the mountain and the other one's lifting up to the peaks and you've got 
eagles overhead and but anyway this this huge great flex of consciousness and the water I mean there's no question you're called to it and and so much other writing writes about this doesn't it the pull of the water and um the sirens and is that a daily practice the swimming yes yeah so do you think that the immersion you know you, I'm interested that your friends said that they would have described you as somebody who hated cold water do you think that sort of full immersion in this living breathing sea that's that's surrounding you totally changes you part of your um has kind of shaped and, and molded your sense of belonging to the island as well yes yeah definitely and oh I don't know there was such a connection you know and the the difficult chapter raw elements on the cusp of uh act two and act three um it wasn't actually a I'm just going to switch this off. Sorry, the things just come on. There we are. My my dragon in the background, the, the uh, stone. Um, it was actually, I mean, for, for however we frame it, it was actually um, a very peaceful state of mind. And it was almost this sense of just wanting to be part of all and all and all. And I'd say it was actually a very spiritual time, you know, and it wasn't my time, but when I was out there and, you know, and it really felt this gift of the, the snow on my cheeks that felt, everything was so soft mm. and felt so loving. Mm. And really that glittering um, awakening, and it was really the beat of love of the universe that I felt, I mean, utterly life-changing you know some people might say an epiphany a spiritual moment you know I meditate I've had very strong very rich um upbringing with both Buddhism and also Christianity you know those Celtic and Indian threads are so densely interwoven and you know I'm more Indian than I am um English and more Irish than I'm English so it's kind of it, it, it all of these threads sort of merge but you know spirit and um you know perhaps what gives our life purpose I think maybe that for me now looking back is kind of quite so perhaps shocking that I got to that point and yet the place that I was in was actually a place of love mm, mm. um and so I don't regret any of that it's all been part of the journey mm. and um yeah how how immense that whole place of being in nature was and um yeah you know that is our true belonging it's who we are organisms aren't we we're ancient beings do, but do you sort of recognize the girl i suppose almost or the young woman that you were before do you feel like you have been kind of changed by this crucible or become more of yourself I think world? more I think more of myself mm. I think more of myself now um I'd like to think I'm I'm not bitter um there's nothing to be bitter of you know we have our own agency how can we be bitter that would be um self-destructive so you know all the way along um I guess I was struggling to find the way and, and how interesting because by going to the water you stop struggling mm. and the water holds you surrender yeah total and you're out of your depth freezing cold water um temperature currents all the rest of it and the most fragile thing that you own and yet the most the most incredible power that you own is your breath mm. and what a paradox mm. and then you realize that your breath is only one tiny part of that greater beat of breath because in that moment in any moment everything is breathing mm. and we're sharing that great inhalation and exhalation I mean that is totally awesome and that's so physically felt and viscerally felt when you're I think really especially out in this sort of environment and terrain. Mm. I mean, it's utterly 
humbling and moving and uplifting and all of it it's different every day I hope I hope one day we'll get to swim together up here yes, Clover yes, love, wouldn't that be amazing that would be amazing it would be amazing can you tell us more about your next book I think that many people would like to know what you're what you'll be writing writing next and where thank you fertile. yeah and then maybe you can tell us a little bit about yours as well <laughs> you're a little bit you're quite somewhere ahead of me um so i'm i'm really happy because i was signed um to write another book um in the autumn so island came out i'm an island came out last summer and um yeah i mean just incredible support and i just wanted to say a huge thank you to everybody out there who's supported it i mean it's been quite phenomenal and um you know the way it just seems to touch people in different ways and it's been a real sort of pass it on book which has mm -hmm. just been wonderful as, as a first time so i really mean that with huge gratitude and love um and on the back of that so um a lot of people a lot of feedback that we were getting was well is she okay and what happens next <laughs> so um i hadn't actually intended to write another book of the island um i kind of thought that's done um but i'm here and my life is here and i've got no plans to move and um there's so much more to explore mm. and probably about our bigger connections um with nature and um how that um how that journey will lead me and those perhaps possibly around me so yeah we'll, 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 ha we'll have to see what's happening there and also alongside it something very lovely um which is um a fine art book and um that's going to be with um photographs um and then just just a, a, a little handful of words from ireland and also some fresh writing to go with that and that'll be called a wilder voice and uh, i'm just just busy with that at the moment as well so it's a lovely thing you know the writing's quite visual always Mm. And um, it's so lovely with I Am An Island and with the one that's coming um, that will be joined with it. Um, that again, the, the, the imagery is, is so much a part of that. Um, so, yeah, just kind of letting it letting it shape. And I think, you know, you and I have spoken about that as well. Sometimes the thing that we map, um, you know, that that's the thing that we map and then life comes in. And there are other threads that then need to be woven in. So it's quite a live process, isn't it? I mean, do you want to say something about yours, Clover? I know we've we've spoken a bit about it, but well, it's... yeah, no, I'm writing a third memoir, and it is about loss. It's about um, my sister died just before lockdown, very suddenly. She did have cancer, but she was only forty six, and and I had not. I was actually working on something completely different, but then. I lost my sister and I write about the things that kind of make me who I am and I write about uh, looking at the kind of painful and darker experiences of life and how that transforms you and how it's actually can be, I mean, just as we've been talking, like incredibly beautiful, incredibly colourful, incredibly exciting. So the book is about walking, I don't want to call it, it's not a book about grief, it's a book about death and it's a book about how to live. And it's been a I've written I've written it quite quickly during lockdown, and it's been a creatively the most exciting thing I've ever done. And I've sort of my writing has gone to new places mm. and trying out new ways of writing and finding as you know you just described writing and you go into a space where you you it's there. You said it's like playing a piano. It's like music, and then you look at it and it's on the page and. I, I mean that's what that's why I do it that feeling of where did this stuff come from and this kind yeah. of like delight and and disbelief that this stuff has come out of you and the fact that then you can walk through the rest of your life and more mundane parts of your life of emptying the bins or making pasta or whatever just doing you know the rhythm of your life and and there the stuff is that creativity is there and I really think that encouraging I mean, on my Instagram, I do interviews with with authors, as you know, I've talked to you and I think encouraging people to to go with that creativity. Because I never thought of myself as a creative person until relatively recently. 
and understanding that it is this kind of power, but also this muscle within you that you can work and work yeah. and you can kind of feed it and nurture it and put the good stuff into it and, you know, read. When people say to me, how do you write? I think reading poetry for me yes. is kind of the most important thing that I can do um, in order to be able to write. But it's a, it feels like a huge... Um, it feels like a huge privilege to be published, certainly, but anybody can write as well, you know, and yes. you, it, it is just a pen and a piece of paper or, or a keyboard. And there are so many places where you can write and be published, like social media, for example. You know, that's why I love Instagram, because it gives you an instant kind of little magazine or little channel that is your own. And I think yeah. that that's, um, there's wonderful opportunities to sort of test out your voice and to allow your voice to find readers and connect with other people mm. because it's not just about finding readers who are going to buy your book and you know it's about connections isn't it it's about it's all that cross-pollination isn't it mm. and um yeah ideas and threads and you know i love reading your posts um and I'm quite struck often how there's almost like a collective unconscious mm. And sometimes something that in the last year as well, actually. Yeah, sometimes the things that the very things that are in your thoughts or your head and somebody else has expressed it beautifully. And you know, that that's 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 an amazing thing, I think. And also, you know, even um it's a bit like weaving all of us together. There's this great big loom that's beating and everybody's stitching in and out their different threads and each of those threads is singular, but together they also make up a different sort of pattern. Um, I've, I've, for myself, you know, certainly living alone, you know, with more than the animals, but um, it's been really a vital connection actually, and um, in, in all sorts of creative shapes and forms. So I have another kind of more of a music community as well, and, you know, scratching away on my viola and um that's 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 equally um yeah fulfilling and rewarding and stimulating and, and different ideas and, and actually work has come out of that as well so uh, it's it it can be used and i hope that more people use it in a really um positive constructive um creative way Tamsin, can I, can I uh, step in? There's, there, there actually hasn't been that many questions. I think that's predominantly because what a great job the pair of you have been doing. It's been um, such a wonderful, wonderful 55 minutes. Um, but the, the, the two questions that have come in are, are, are kind of connected, actually. Um, Margaret and, and Nadia ask, um, uh, I, I'll, I'll ask Nadia's question. It's longer, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very well written. Two of my favourite authors, this is a real treat. As an English woman, who moved to the northeast of Scotland as a child, I could resonate a lot with how you were received as, as an outsider, um, though not as extreme. Would be interested to hear if how your relationship changed with the islanders when the book was published. I think that's a, it's a yeah. question that was in my mind as well. How, how did, was the book read broadly by? Absolutely, yes, it, yes it was. And um, it's been such an interesting year this year. So. Um, the book came out last, well, the book was meant to come out last May, and in the end we had to do a soft launch um, because of lockdown. So we published um, the audio book and then the Kindle, and then the hardback didn't come out until the shops opened again in, in July. There was a brief time when things were open. So I remember in March flying back from recording the audio book and that was just straight into lockdown. Now, lockdown out here in the islands was really, has been really uh, strict, uh, very, you know, very fragile communities. We don't have a doctor here. Um, you know, it was really important that it didn't come here. We've been very fortunate it didn't. It got very close. Some of the island, other islands weren't so fortunate. But in that process, um, Obviously, the book had come out. Um, the articles that I'd written uh, were obviously quite different to some other articles that were written as well. And there, there was also um, certain things that were perhaps uh, misquoted and misframed, which was, um, 
you know, for me, that was a totally new experience because I'd not been in the press before. And, you know, things like, so Crystal was obviously local to here and a very beloved dear friend of mine. Crystal was actually Scottish. So it was a total nonsense to say that, you know, um, you know, a relationship was framed because of somebody's accent. Um, and there, there was sort of a, a few things like that where sort of a few eyebrows were probably raised. Um, but actually these subjects that I spoke of have all since come out in the wash. And actually one thing that um, I suppose that I was quite careful about with the book, all of these experiences were very distilled grace notes. There was a much bigger intensity of experience that was lived and everything was obviously, um, you know, backed up for publication, but I wasn't the only one. And that's very important to articulate that. So we are always going to be demographically directly proportionate to everywhere else in the world you know we're a microcosm of a macrocosm problems that we experience with humanity here are going to be felt all over the world um, and you know a lot of these uh, subjects that were covered in the book uh, so many of them have come out in the last year so questions of um, what does loneliness mean what does solitude mean we've all experienced different degrees of that we've had unconscious bias with um ethnic minorities being raised um in all sorts of different ways but you know a much bigger conversation there of how bias can be framed um and then also you know the question of female voice and how one can be silenced in all sorts of again very uh, subtle ways even rather than overt. So again, these are all much bigger narratives that's being had. And that's made the whole process a lot uh, smoother in, in many ways. Um, in that, you know, the book kind of came out 12 months ago, but actually in the last 12 months, and even in the last few weeks, um, many of these things are now being aired. And I'm really gratified by that. You know, there's been an overwhelming um, response from, people from further afield but also here on the island not from everyone as you might expect but actually from everyone I'd now say these narratives are being aired and you know I'm actually myself actively involved in creative projects that explore um, other sort of aspects so what does belonging mean what does it mean to be silent and these are things that are all being explored in various different uh, formats and mediums by initiated by other people and I've been asked to contribute and join those so it's a really expansive uh, time just now and, and one that's really really helpful but I say on the whole um, a lot of a lot of support and a lot of respect and I guess you know someone around here the other day said you know I didn't want to read this book and now I've read it it's actually challenged me to explore my own positions and uh, perhaps things that I was unaware of or perhaps was unable to voice or, or perhaps wasn't even conscious of and so we've, we've had some really healthy um, dialogue so yeah it's, be, it's to be welcomed it's it's mm. And, and long may that continue. That feels like maybe an attitudinal change over the last 12 months, perhaps, in with things that have happened across the world. And um, Well, there's uh, been a, quite a big conscious shift, hasn't there? I mean, it's, you know, it's always evolving and, you know, three steps forward, two back. But let's hope the forward movement keeps happening. And so long as we're, we sort of are authentic and honest with ourselves. And I think also in that bigger way, you know, you can have, a, a point of view uh, where you've got a, a bigger sort of scenario and in principle one one sort of holds a stand how does one then respond when it's actually happening right there on your home turf that's a, that's another different thing as well and and again you know others have come forward as I said you know I was sheltering other women as well and uh, that it's been a it's been a really really positive experience um, yeah I'm deeply conscious of the time. Look at that. I mean, honestly, uh, you're so easy to talk to, the pair of you, frankly. It's, um, uh, it seems deeply shaming to have to end it here. I'm, um, I'm, I'm rather embarrassed to, to now just plug a couple of things that we're doing. <laughs> and uh, we've got Mel Gildreich and Rachel Joyce um, 
uh, two equally wonderful um, women uh, who are here on Saturday. I say here, virtually here on Saturday night. And then, uh, and then next um, Wednesday, uh, we're doing this. Um, we've been asked by the RHS to host a series of events, a uh, series of monthly events, gardening events. So, um, and quite aptly, um, the first one is, is Kate Bradbury and Sally Next about how gardening in tune with nature and the environment is something we can all do. So I think uh, uh, that's something Tamsin and Clover, I'm sure, would entirely. In fact, let me just um, circulate that link. There we go. That's on the chat function. Um, Tamsin, you've been gorgeous. Thank you so much for your time. And um, Thank you for having both <laughs> me and Clover. It's, it's been wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Clover, I did put your uh, a link to, to people to buy your book on the, on the chat function a little earlier. So, guys, if you haven't got it already, um, you can buy it there. A um, couple of little comments. Nadia, uh, when can we come and visit Tamsin? Maybe some <laughs> workshops. <laughs> yeah, there will be. There will actually be that opportunity in the future. Um, just still a fair bit more work to do here on getting the place done up but I am actually going to be holding retreats in the future so that's that's something that um yeah we're talking about reading landscape in all sorts of different ways and um yeah creative uh, retreats as well and with the nature and the swimming and all of that so um yeah watch watch this space Gail uh not a question just a thank you from uh for a wonderful soulful interview uh I'm sure we'll all second that uh, and um, another comment. Thanks so much, Tamsin. I too love Highland Ponies. Love that you both weave horses into your books too. Can't wait for the next books yeah. from you both. Thank you very much. Clover, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been lovely. It's been a really lovely conversation. Thank you. Yeah, lovely to speak with you again, Clover. And so much love. And we'll catch up. Who knows? Yeah. Perhaps if you've both got books coming out later this year, perhaps we can do something in the autumn. I'm, I'm thinking of a physical event. Uh, we, we're doing a, uh, the Tring Book Festival is November. So uh, who knows? Maybe then, maybe then. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yes, yeah, yeah. thank you all. And we'll